thanks so much, everybody, for joining us for today's CLE. We are, what are we doing today? We're doing How to Successfully Litigate a Personal Injury Case Series, Part 2, Settle Early Settlement, Jurisdiction, Venue, and Commencing the Lawsuit. It's a grand title. We have a lot to get to today. No, um, so I'm going to start us off with some messages from our sponsors. These are the folks that are footing the bill, making it free for all of you to attend. So we ask you to be respectful, listen to their messages, and most importantly, use their services should you find yourself in need. Hello, my name is George Freitag. I'm one of the arbitrators and mediators here at NAM. Over the years, I've mediated and arbitrated over a thousand personal injury matters, including premises cases, motor vehicle accidents, complex multi-million dollar labor law cases. For the past four years, I've been voted by my colleagues as one of the top 10 arbitrators in the state of New York. I'd like to encourage you to allow myself and Nan to help move your case towards a satisfying conclusion. I look forward to seeing you all soon. And please enjoy the following presentation. Medivisuals is the nation's most experienced medical legal illustration company, having worked on over 34,000 medical legal cases in the past 35 years. Get started quickly and efficiently by calling and discussing your case with one of Medivisuals' knowledgeable medical illustrators and visual consultants. Some attorneys will see the name Paramount Settlement Planning and say, oh, that's a fancy name for a structured settlement firm. That's not what we are. We are, in fact, a planning firm. Our attorneys and our team are well-versed in protecting public benefits, the interplay between workers' compensation, Social Security, Disability, and Medicare, understanding the totality of the circumstances and planning to help protect not only the plaintiff, but plaintiff's counsel, and then developing a plan for the future of the plaintiff, whether the plaintiff accepts it or not, at least plaintiff's counsel has something in their file where they've been advised of their options and has turned it down or has accepted it. Awesome. Thanks so much to all our sponsors. Again, putting the bill, making this possible and doable for all of you. I am going to introduce our fabulous speaker for today, Mr. Andrew Smiley. He's the lead trial attorney at Smiley & Smiley LLP. He practices significant personal injury, medical malpractice, and wrongful death litigation. Been practicing for 25 years, is an alum of my law school, Brooklyn Law. Woo woo, Brooklyn. Um, also went to Tulane University undergrad. He's a past president of the Academy, a current board member and exec committee member, and a frequent CLE lecturer for the Academy. He's also a past president and board member for the New York City Trial Lawyers Alliance. And most um, importantly, in my view, is the host of the podcast, The Mentor ESQ, which everyone should listen to. It is free and available wherever you get your podcasts. And I highly recommend season two, episode two, for no good reason. All right, Andrew, it's all yours. Take it away. Thank you so much, Michelle. Uh, thank you for joining me, coming back for part two. And uh, we have a lot to get to uh, in today's session. But for those that are just joining in on part two, thank you for joining. Uh, this is a live webinar that uh, will exist forever after today uh, on the Academy site. If you're not a member, you need to join. Everything's free. Uh, and you can go back into the digital library, listen to this, see this uh, CLE. Also on the Mentor ESQ podcast, the information is above. Uh, all of these CLEs will forever be there. And uh, some of you are listening now at the podcast. Maybe you can catch us next on the uh, live webinar, which will be uh, the first Wednesday of each month through July. So the next one's March 3rd, put it on your calendars. Just as an overview of what this is for those who are new and as a reminder for those from part one, we are gonna go in granular fashion from the beginning of when you first get the case, and sign, the, sign up the client and get retained, which we did in part one, all the way through to verdict and what happens after verdict. Uh, that'll be part seven. So I'm trying to open up my playbook, share it with all of you, uh, let you know from my perspective what I have found that works well. We have a wide range of experience. I have the benefit of seeing the pre-registered list. Uh, so I know that there are some new lawyers and there are some lawyers that have much more experience than I do. We even have at least one Supreme Court justice attending 
2018. Shout out to the Honorable Frederick Sampson, who I had the privilege of uh, trying what may have been one of the last, well, definitely was one of, it may have been the last trial to go to verdict in Queens in 2020 in March, right before everything shut down. It was an honor to be in front of uh, Judge Sampson, and uh, I'm sure he knows a lot more than I do on this topic, but take what you want from my CLEs. Uh, when I attend CLEs, there's always tidbits that, uh, that it's good to pick up on that may refresh you. Some of the stuff we're going to talk about today, you may not have really looked at since law school, CPLR class, you may just do things automatically. So hopefully you'll pick up some new uh, pointers as we go through today and in future um, uh, CLE episodes. So as far as materials, what I find when I'm attending CLEs is I like materials that are usable. So I will continue to give you templates, samples from my practice. Feel free to use, copy as you will, uh, that apply in each of the you know, parts. So in this part, you will see in the materials provided uh, through this webinar, um, the statutes that are going to apply that we're going to talk about, I've copied those for you, as well as a bunch of sample complaints and summons, uh, and we'll talk about those as we go through, but feel free to copy, use those uh, in your cases and rely upon those because those have all worked well for me. So let's get to it. Um, I'm going to go through it. Feel free to drop your questions in the Q&A. Uh, I want this to be beneficial to you. I want to answer all of your questions. There will be a Q&A at the end starting at two o'clock that a lot of you uh, will likely stay on and I'm happy to sit and answer as many questions as possible. If I don't touch on your question, if questions come up after the CLE, reach out to me. A lot of people did after part one. I get back to everybody. Uh, I'm happy to speak with you, email with you, whatever you like. I'm here to help out. So today we're going to talk about early settlement, um, jurisdiction, venue, and drafting, uh, filing, and serving the complaint. Again, all of these topics can be their own CLE. We only have now 50 minutes left. So I'm going to try and move pretty quickly and highlight the things that I think are important. First off, early settlement. As plaintiff's lawyer, which I am, and I know a lot of you are not, I know there's a lot of claims representatives um, from insurance companies, defense lawyers, so this should be an insight to what's going on on the plaintiff's side in, in our minds. And our goal is and should always be to get justice for our clients. And in civil litigation, that justice is in the form of compensation. So whether you get that compensation for your client before filing suit, after filing suit, after a jury verdict, uh, it doesn't matter when, the goal is to get them fair and reasonable compensation and get it as fast as you can for them. And that's what I always strive to do and the lawyers in my practice strive to do. Sometimes that can be done without filing a lawsuit. Sometimes it can't. So there will come a time in every case that you have as a plaintiff that you have to decide, is this a case to settle that we may have a shot at settling before suit or do we need to put it in suit? Uh, on the defense side, and if you're an insurance uh, representative, claims adjuster, you should have that same consideration. Look, is this a case we can settle pre-suit uh, and, and should be settled pre-suit, or do we want our lawyers to get involved in, in what comes with litigating the case? Um, I have found, even since the pandemic has started, more of a willingness uh, for defense firms and insurance companies to talk pre-suit filing and to consider perhaps alternative dispute resolution, ADR. We just saw that preview from Nam. George Freitag's a great guy. If you don't know him, he's one of us. He's a lawyer and he's really good at getting cases resolved. Use him. I have found uh, people willing to agree to go into binding arbitration in lieu of a litigation with Nam. You could set out the parameters. So look into doing that. Uh, try and get your case resolved. If you can get it resolved early for a fair, reasonable amount, look, you got to give maybe a little bit of a discount of what you might get in three years of litigation. But if it's still in that wheelhouse within the range, uh, then you should seriously attempt or at least make a good faith attempt to get there. So how do I decide when a case uh, is ripe for a pre-suit settlement or just to file the complaint? Well, First of all, you need to see if the case is ripe. And what do I mean by that? You have to have all the medicals because you're not going anywhere with a phone call or a letter. You can't settle a case unless you have all of your clients treating medical records, past, current uh, records, and pre-injury, post-injury. 
uh, and get those over to the claims representative to evaluate. Uh, those two things have to happen for a case to settle. So you need to make sure you've gotten all the records, you've exchanged all the records. Don't hold back, give everything. You need to give your records to your adversaries. That's how they can evaluate your case and move it. Um, then you wanna see uh, where your client is at as far as treatment. And on the defense side, you wanna see is the plaintiff done treating? What are the injuries? Um, because if you really don't have a handle on the injuries uh, yet, uh, if they're developing, for example, uh, you get retained on a case where a client has really bad back uh, pain and maybe some herniations, cervical herniations. They're following up with the doctor. They're trying conservative treatment, but may need a fusion surgery. You may just need to wait because you wouldn't want to settle that case for non-surgical value um, and on the and with the potential that they may need a fusion surgery. You could be talking a difference of potentially a million dollars in value. If I'm on the defense side, I'm looking to settle these cases before they have that surgery, if you can. Give that a push. Um, so size that up, uh, where they are with treatment um, and uh, whether or not you can really assess where they are. Maybe they're having surgery and uh, you know that's scheduled. Uh, and then you want to look at what you're dealing with insurance coverage. If your clients had a fusion surgery, uh, but and you know there's the potential for more surgery or more treatment, but it's a hundred thousand dollar insurance policy, uh, and if you you've explored all additional coverage, by that I mean what the tort fees are has in coverage. Make sure there's no excess coverage that the tort feeser has. Explore all possible tort feesers. If it's a car accident, obviously the operator and owner. Uh, you want to look maybe the roadway or trees hanging over. Maybe there's a city case involved. Uh, you want to explore all tort feasors, explore all avenues of coverage. Uh, look and see if there's SUM or UM coverage. Uh, for those of, who, those of you who were kind enough to ask me a lot of questions about SUM in part one, uh, Michelle and I were here for you. Next thing you know, we've got a, a CLE scheduled two weeks from today. We're just going to talk about SUM and UM. So questions come up today. You want me to talk more in detail about a specific topic, let us know. We'll set up a CLE for you. But you want to exhaust all of those avenues of coverage. And if you say, look, unfortunately, this client has really bad injuries. The policy is less than the potential injuries. You really shouldn't be litigating that case. Uh, you need to uh, get that case settled get everything to the adjuster. And in my experience, most adjusters, once they have the records, if clearly it's an injury worth more than the policy, they'll tender it. And it's worth your patience letting the adjuster review the records, work it up the chain on their end to get the case settled without putting it into suit. So those are the situations where I would look to settle a case uh, pre-suit. Um, bird in the hand, uh, less expenses that are chargeable to your client, uh, even with a little bit of a discount, it's always a good idea if you can get there early. It makes you look great uh, in uh, your client's eyes. So when would I say, you know what, I, I'm just going to file suit on this case. I'm not going to wait more for records. I'm not going to try and do a, a pre-lawsuit um, settlement in a couple of situations. First of all, in an infant case, uh, if your client is under the age of 18, uh, you are going to need an infant compromise order. You cannot settle a minor's case without a court order. So even if you get the policy tendered right away, whatever uh, success you have as far as settlement, you're going to have to get into the court system. So you might as well file that summons and complaint as soon as you have your investigation done, you know what the case is about, you have the information you need to draft and file it, file it because you're going to need to get an RJI, which is a request for judicial intervention. Uh, even if you haven't filed a complaint, you're gonna have to file something with the court. Might as well get the case moving forward uh, and get the court involved. It also helps for purposes of settlement. In an infant case, you can tell your adversary and the adjuster, listen, I, I may agree with you on the, on the value here, but a judge may not. And we've got to make sure that we're getting the right amount for this uh, infant because it has to pass muster with uh, a Supreme Court judge who's gonna sign off on this order. So sometimes you can use that to help get a better settlement. Uh, lastly, you would look into, as far as a pre-suit alternative, like I said, private arbitration, you consider doing high-low arbitration, set parameters. Um, explore all of that before getting into the legal system. I've always been a fan of that, but even now with this pandemic, cases aren't being tried. 
Uh, we are all going to be waiting a long time for cases to come up for trial uh, when we usually would get to the point of settlement. It's not going to happen for a while. So it's your job as an advocate to use all the tools in your toolbox to get your client's case resolved as soon as possible. And I would say as a defense lawyer, if you have clients that you hold dear in insurance companies uh, and they just want you to get to resolution, I would also recommend that. You're gonna save your client a lot of money if you get into a binding high-low arm early on, if you look into alternative dispute resolution as opposed to litigation. Um, this is the new way, folks, and uh, you might as well start doing it now. I think it's gonna continue on. My personal belief is that the ADR world is gonna slowly take over uh, for the court system in a lot of cases. So we'll see how that plays out. So an infant case, get that summons and complaint ready to go. In a death case, get that summons and complaint ready to go. Uh, many of you know that in a death case, you have to have uh, a legal uh, representative of the estate appointed to bring that case. So that's either gonna be limited letters of administration, which is going to need a court order from the surrogate court or the Supreme Court judge at the conclusion of the case, if that's a settlement. Uh, if the party has full letters of administration, then that may not be as much of a concern. But if you know ultimately you're going to be in a courthouse to get this case settled, that's a case that you want to consider filing suit on. You also want to consider filing a summons and complaint if you have a really good case as a plaintiff, potentially big value, and the client's a little shaky. You're not sure if they're going to stay around. You think uh, they may, uh, there may be other lawyers talking in their ear trying to take the case. If you have any worry about holding on to a case, you want to file suit right away. That protects your lien. You don't have an automatic lien as an attorney just because you had a file open at the beginning of a case. Some lawyers think you do. You do not. Uh, a lien arises contractually if you have an agreement with an outgoing law firm uh, for a lien, uh, and it arrives as a charging lien if you've done work on a file and you want to not give up your file until they agree to give you a lien, and also if you appear in a case. Uh, judiciary law 475, note that if you're in any kind of legal lien fight, law, uh, legal fee fight uh, situation, uh, Judiciary Law 475 controls that. And as long as you appear in a case, appearing is filing a notice of appearance in the court system, it is filing a summons and complaint, it is um, filing uh, for an arbitration, signing an agreement for a binding uh, arbitration or perhaps even a mediation, those will be considered appearing on a case and you will be entitled automatically under the judiciary law for a lien to be determined based on quantum merit at the end of the case. So if you're worried if this case is gonna last, hang around a, a, a long enough uh, or not, get that complaint filed, that is going to protect you legally for your lien. Lastly, when I decide to file a summons a complaint, is if I'm just getting nowhere with the claims representative. Uh, it's very frustrating, but usually you find out pretty early on, I try and make contact uh, and get off on the right foot with the claims adjuster. That is often the one responding to my claim letter on whatever type of case it is. Tell them about the case, get the medicals right away and try and get a sense of whether they're interested in pre litigation settlement or mediation or arbitration. Sometimes they're very forthcoming and say, listen, I am interested, but you know, we have to committee it. I need some more records. You can get this all to me. Um, and you start to get a sense of whether they're really serious about it or not. Then you have those claims representatives. I hope none of you are on this program. And if you are, you need to change your ways who just blow you off and they don't answer your calls. Uh, and you're trying to reach out to them, trying to see if it's a case that can be resolved. And I run into that, unfortunately, a lot. They just don't respond to my emails. I send them everything. I follow up regularly uh, and they just totally, totally blow me off. And if that happens, then you have to file suit. Um, filing suit will get a lawyer involved to look at the case right away if it's one that's worth settling early. So it's a new set of eyes. And oftentimes filing suit will trigger a new claims representative. So if you're not having luck or a good rapport with the claims representative you're speaking with pre-suit, filing suit will often get you to a new claims representative and you can have talks. So sometimes the filing of the suit, the summons and complaint doesn't mean you're going down the path of 
full litigation, but it's a tool to activate settlement talks. So these are all considerations about early settlement that I think about that you should think about, but you, you need to think about early settlement. And if you decide after weighing all of these factors I've discussed and others out and speaking with your client, and of course, explain, I'm big on information. I give information to my clients all the time. Explain to them what you're trying to do. Explain to them to be a little bit patient. You think there may be a shot at a pre-suit settlement. Obviously, you're not going to settle their case unless it's in their best interest and you can strongly recommend it and the numbers are there uh, to be patient with you while you work this out. You're going to save the money uh, from having to file suit. Uh, they, you may even waive your expenses. We often do that if we can settle a case pre-suit. Uh, so explain to them what you're doing. So they're not sitting back wondering, why is my lawyer not started my lawsuit yet? Uh, explain to them your thinking. Uh, talk it out with them and your colleagues. And then if you make that decision, okay, it's time to file suit. Then we go on to the next part of what we're going to be talking about today, and that is drafting the complaint. Now, the most important, one of the most important things before you get pen to paper, as we say, uh, get fingers to keyboard uh, to draft, all, draft a complaint for your case is where are you going to file suit? Um, now, that means what state um, what county, uh, state court, federal court. These are all things that you need to consider. Now, I practice in New York State. We are the New York State Academy of Trial Lawyers that's participating uh, in these CLEs with my podcast. And although I know uh, many of you may not be in New York State, the same thing applies. You most likely want to bring the case in your state, for starters. You don't want to litigate in a state that you're not uh, admitted in or not comfortable practicing in. So the very first thing you need to do is make sure that this case, your potential plaintiff and client has jurisdiction in New York State. If you're in New York State, if you're a Connecticut lawyer uh, and your client's in Connecticut and you want to bring it in Connecticut, you have to see if you have jurisdiction in your state. So how is that determined? Here's where we're going back to law school a little bit. Uh, I've included in the materials the CPLR statute about jurisdiction, and that's CPLR section 302. And what we're talking about here is personal jurisdiction. How do you get jurisdiction over a person? Um, and how is it appropriate to bring it in the state? So the easy way is if you have uh, the plaintiff and the defendant, they're both New York State residents and the accident happened in New York State, no problem, it's a New York State case. Then you could move on to talk about what county and whether state or federal court. Um, but let's say you've got an auto accident. It happens in New York State. Um, your client is a New York State resident, but the person who struck your client is from out of state. What happens there? Do you have jurisdiction over the defendant, the potential defendant, because that defendant lives in a different state? The answer is yes. And that is because they appeared in this state and caused an accident. So if the accident happens here in New York, you're good to go, even if the tortfeasor is an out-of-state tortfeasor. But what happens if your client is a New York resident, drives up to Connecticut for the weekend, gets in an accident in Connecticut, with a Connecticut uh, driver, uh, the car's registered in Connecticut. Can you bring that case in New York because your practice is in New York and your clients in New York? The answer is most likely no, you can't because New York State doesn't have jurisdiction over the defendant. So this is what jurisdiction means. And sometimes it's pretty tough questions uh, that you have to ask to see if you can get jurisdiction. Sometimes you have to get creative. Um, maybe it's a corporate defendant and the accident happens outside of New York State. But that corporation or that business has offices in New York State, conducts business in New York State. Um, then perhaps uh, you can bring it in New York State. I've handled a lot of cases where a client of mine uh, from New York uh, or maybe even outside of New York goes on vacation and is at a Hyatt in Acapulco, uh, Mexico, and uh, they get injured in, uh, in Mexico. The question is, can we bring that case in New York? Uh, 
So there are laws that apply that show whether just the Hyatt having a website uh, and in New York, you can book it from your computer in New York. They have offices in New York. They have a Hyatt in New York. Um, can you bring the case? Um, at the time I handled that case, I brought it in federal court and uh, we were about to get a decision. We were arguing the motion practice on, on jurisdiction and the case resolved because we weren't sure where it was going to go. But sometimes you have to get creative. The purpose of considering jurisdiction is knowing where you stand. You have to give it thought and you have to um, assess where all the players are. So look at the statute, speak to colleagues, reach out to me if it's one of these weird law school type problems of jurisdiction and try and sort it out. But you have to have jurisdiction within the state to bring a lawsuit against someone within that state. All right. So in New York, you want to file in New York, you have to have jurisdiction over all of the defendants. If one defendant there's multiple defendants and one is not in the state and the accident didn't happen in the state that you can't just pull them in. So it's tricky stuff. So jurisdiction, give that a look. Now, let's say you have jurisdiction. Then we go to venue. Venue refers to which county can you file in. Classic case. Um, uh, my practice is in Manhattan. I practice in all the counties and boroughs all over surrounding the city in New York and the accident happens in, the defendant is in Westchester, the plaintiff is in the Bronx, and uh, the car accident happens in Queens. Well, where can you bring the case? Where should you file it? Well, you know you have jurisdiction in New York. The accident happened in New York State. All the parties are in New York State. So what county is right? And in the scenario I gave you, all three of those are right. You have your choice of where the defendant resides, which county the defendant is, which county the plaintiff resides in, and also where the action and the bulk of the circumstances of the lawsuit took place. That's relatively new amendment uh, to CPLR 503. That is what controls venue. It wasn't always where the accident took place. So that's in there now. I've attached that statute, so take a look at it. So you have your pick, and you want to pick what you think will be the most friendly venue for you. Uh, so if in a plaintiff's case, obviously, if I can bring the case in the Bronx, uh, I'm going to bring it there instead of Westchester, for example. I know Westchester is not as plaintiff friendly with jurors as the Bronx is. So you're going to want to look and try and find the venue that is going to bring the best result for your client. Um, if you have the right to choose uh, initially uh, on a defense side, you want to get that case venued in Westchester and not the Bronx. So these are the things you need to consider as far as venue. Uh, what is going to be the best venue? And it's not always clear. I had a medical malpractice case that I could have brought in Queens or in New York County. And I spoke with colleagues of mine, I reach out that do medical malpractice uh, cases like I do. And I got two different takes. One of them said, you'll probably have a better plaintiff friendly jury in Queens. The other said, uh, the med mal judges in New York really have designated medical malpractice parts and may be more familiar. And you may find it much easier to try your case and practice uh, and move your case in New York. So I had to decide where to file based on that. So it's not a one answer uh, to these questions, but your job as the lawyer is to consider all of these. So take a look at uh, CPLR 503 and give some serious thought to your venue. If your practice is in Brooklyn or your practice is in, um, is in uh, uh, Staten Island and you know the court personnel and the judges you appear in front of regularly, you may want to bring the case in your county. It's your home turf. Think of you know, home field advantage. That's what you need to think of and where to file suit. Um, you know, if you give the sports analogy, you'd rather play in front of your home team than go to another team's stadium with their fans, uh, potentially their refs. So you figure you're going to get the base, the best shot where you feel most comfortable that you can do the best for your client. And that may be different for different lawyers. So think about that. Um, and that goes into the consideration of federal court versus state court. Uh, I did a whole CLE on litigating personal injury cases in federal court with my good friend and colleague and also past academy president, Hadley Matarazzo. She practices with Farachi Lang in Rochester. And uh, we had a great CLE where we talked about how you handle personal injury cases in federal court and the pros and cons. Um, 
So a whole CLE can be on that. But briefly, uh, the pros of bringing it in federal court is equalizing the turf. So let's say you've got a case that's in a county in a part of the state you're not familiar with, uh, but you have diversity jurisdiction and you can bring it in federal court in the district and not state court. Uh, you may want to do that because it's going to equal the playing field because the federal rules are the same no matter where in the state or in the country you go. District courts are going to follow all the federal rules of practice. There's not different local county rules, different state rules. So you know what you're dealing with. And if you're comfortable in federal court with the federal rules of practice and the federal rules of evidence, you know what you're working with and you can level the playing field. I like federal court a lot for a lot of cases. It moves the cases quickly. There's no nonsense. Judges are available when you need them right away. Um, I, none of my cases have slowed down and that are in federal court through this pandemic. Uh, we are cooking with oil, as they say. And I like that. Uh, I'm one of those lawyers that's prepared and on point. I like federal court because you have to be prepared and on point. If you're not prepared and on point, you're not gonna find uh, federal court to be a friendly place. But uh, again, that's something to consider. If you have the opportunity to go into federal court, weigh the pros and cons. Depending on the case, if it's an auto accident case, if I, I love bringing uh, cases against cab companies that my client is injured by a cab in New York City, I love bringing those in federal court if I have an out of state uh, client and I can get diversity jurisdiction because um, you know cab companies, the carriers for cab companies and their lawyers are usually not in federal court and they don't care to be there. And it helps really move those cases, keep the pressure on. There's really no expert discovery you have to worry about, motion practice you're not too worried about. So those are great cases if you can as a plaintiff to bring in federal court. On the downside, federal court has full expert discovery. You have to get your expert reports in early. It's not like New York State Court where you can wait until you know the last minute before trial to come up with an export, expert. You have to exchange your expert reports with their fee schedule. You have to produce your expert for depositions. You can take depositions of your adversaries experts. It gets really expensive really fast. So you need to be prepared for that, especially if you're thinking of like a product liability case or a case where you know you're gonna have experts based on the subject matter. Um, you wanna consider whether or not you wanna go down that path and if the case is worth it. Some cases are and some aren't. That's a decision you'll have to make. Again, reach out to me if you wanna workshop any of that as far as your decision. You know, that's part of what we do as a community, as lawyers. We need to talk to the lawyer in the next office, in our firm, call our colleagues up, bounce it off other people because there's never one right answer. And it's, you wanna pick everybody's brains. I do it all the time and I, you know, lecture on this stuff and um, I've been practicing a long time, but I'm always reaching out to colleagues to bounce things off of them. It helps you make an informed decision uh, for your client. So you're gonna to wanna to think about that. I'm going to share another sponsor's message with you all, because again, our sponsors are footing the bill and are awesome. So you should listen to their messages and use their services. All right, here we go. Before you step away, I'm an attorney in New York, and I can save you hundreds of hours per year and reduce your client's liens by an average of over 50% at no cost to your law firm. My team at Medical Lien Agency handles Medicare, Medicaid, Workers' Comp, ERISA, and private doctor's liens, and we only get paid based on the successful reduction of the lien. Our services get you and your clients paid faster. You practice the law, we'll handle the liens. Contact us today. Hi, I'm Lana O'Brien, Associate General Counsel at Creative Capital, New York's leading structured settlement firm. On any case you settle, Always put your client's right to structure tax-free and be represented by an independent broker like Creative Capital. Creative Capital can also assist with your pre-settlement preparation on cases falling under New York's CPLR 50A and 50B. Hundreds of plaintiffs have received larger settlements as a result of our exposure-based approach during mediation, all free of charge. Contact us today. We look forward to working with you.
For nearly 50 years, OAS, Occupational Assessment Services, has helped victims of catastrophic injury get the compensation they deserve. OAS founder Ed Provder and his team develop comprehensive life care plans to calculate lifetime medical costs for plaintiffs, as well as employment assessments to determine realistic income prospects. This is Mark Perez. Mark experienced a two-story fall at work. He was left with a traumatic brain injury and seizure disorder. OAS worked on his case, and the jury awarded Mark $102 million. If your client has suffered a life-altering catastrophic injury, call OAS or visit OASinc.org. Awesome. Thanks so much to all of our amazing sponsors for putting the bill and making this all happen. Andrew, back to you. Great. Thanks, Michelle. Michelle is uh, in the running for one of the most viewed uh, and listened to episodes. We're well into season two of the podcast, The Mentor ESQ. But if you haven't listened to it, if you are finding value in this CLE or in some of the CLEs that you've uh, attended that I've participated in, I think you'll find a lot of value in the podcast because there are a lot of CLE lectures that uh, you can get credit for through the Academy. You just click on the form that's in the description. And there's a lot of really good interviews with lawyers. I'd like to give a shout Shout out to Cliff Aaron, who I think is attending uh, here today on part two, uh, who does everything that I do in a courtroom, but as a defense lawyer and without the benefit of his vision. And his uh, interview was quite something, and he's a remarkable uh, man and an amazing lawyer. I also recently interviewed um, Eric Gonzalez, the district attorney for Kings County, and most recently interviewed a lawyer who races cars, which is something that I uh, like to do in my spare time as well. So there's some interesting stuff there. Check it out. All right. Now, getting back to the choice of federal court versus state court. The way you get into federal court, if you so desire, um, is that there has to be some uh, federal jurisdiction. And there's many different types of cases, like if it's a constitutional question of law, uh, stuff that we most likely won't come across. The one, uh, the one statute that allows us in injury cases in civil disputes to get into federal court is diversity of citizenship. And I've attached that statute for you in the materials, uh, and that's 28 USCA 1332. And basically, as long as you have parties from different states, and I still remember this from my CPLR class at Brooklyn Law School. So you picture the V, uh, plaintiff V defendant, and every plaintiff has to be from a different state than every defendant. If you have a New York defendant, one of five, and a New York plaintiff, you don't have diversity. Everyone's got to be from different states. So it's a little tricky, but in a simple case, one's from New York, one's from Connecticut, as long as the amount in controversy exceeds $75,000, uh, which you don't really have to prove, doesn't mean if your case ends up settling for less than $75,000 in federal court, you get in trouble, um, then you have the right to bring it. And interestingly, depending if you have a death case, depending on the residency of where the uh, administrator or executor is appointed. You know, if they live in Connecticut, but they were appointed as executor by the Kings County Surrogates Court and got their letters of administration, then Kings County is what county you'll use for purposes of determining venue and jurisdiction. So to give you an idea of when I weigh these factors and how it worked out to my benefit, um, I was approached uh, many years ago on a very uh, significant case uh, with potential for very large damages, uh, a fire, burn, death, bad injury, brain, in brain injury case burns in the Bronx. And I could have brought the case in Bronx Supreme Court, but the guardian uh, of the injured party was from out of state in Pennsylvania. And uh, that's where the, uh, the guardianship was in New York, but the guardian herself lived in Pennsylvania. And I decided that, hey, if we brought this case in the Bronx, we're gonna go nowhere. We're gonna wait for years for a trial date. This was pre-pandemic and they're gonna blow us off. We're gonna need a lot of real discovery and we're just not gonna get anywhere. They're gonna stonewall us. Let's spend the money, it's worth it. Let's go to federal court, let's move this case. So we brought it in the Southern District in Manhattan based on diversity uh, using her address in Pennsylvania. Uh, there was an issue at first of whether it applied the, the, the magistrate judge even asked her, the district court judge actually uh, at the time, Judge Hellerstein said, are you sure it's right to be here? Because if you're not, if you, we don't have subject matter jurisdiction, you can go to a verdict and it gets thrown out. So I wanna make sure you guys all know what's going on. 
We double checked the law, everybody felt comfortable and off we went in federal court. And I'm glad we did. The case resolved last April in the middle of when the pandemic kicked off uh, only because we we're in federal court and we we're able to push and move the case so far. So that's part of the thought process that went into play. All right, now also in federal court, you need a unanimous jury. Uh, usually of uh, eight people. So um, it has to be a minimum of six, usually eight. So there's a downside to that as well. Be aware if you bring it in federal court, you need unanimity of your jury, which is also a downside. So Southern District Manhattan uni uh, uh, United Jury, uh, uh, as opposed to a state Bronx jury, obviously you'd rather try your case in front of a state Bronx jury as plaintiff, but here it ended up working out to our benefit. So I was pleased that we made the right call. All right, now let's get to drafting the complaint uh, in the time we have left. And I'm sorry, we only have 15 minutes. I am staying on at two for q and I saw a lot of Q&A was put in the, uh, into the chat in the q and I'm gonna get to as many of them as I can, I promise. But let me cruise through these next 17 minutes because it's really important. When it comes to drafting the complaint, you need to take your time. You need to do your homework. You need to do your investigation and you need to speak on certain cases with your experts before you draft your complaint. The complaint is your foundation. Think of it as a house. Before you even start building your house and building your case, you need that foundation solid and strong. That complaint is your foundation. If you screw up on the complaint and it doesn't get caught, you can go pretty far in the case, including post verdict and run into real problems, including getting your case thrown out. Um, while you can have leave freely to amend your complaint and amend your pleadings up through an including trial, you're not always going to get it depending on what you're looking to amend, okay? So we amend complaints all the time. You may name the wrong party. You may need to change things. That all happens usually pretty early on. You don't want to be in a situation where you're amending your complaint at the time of trial. That's playing with fire. So take your time. You need to identify the proper parties, Sometimes it's easy, folks. An auto case, a simple auto case, you know who the parties are, you look at the police report, you have the owner, the registered owner, the driver, your injured passenger, that's it. But what if it's a premises case? Do you know who the managing agent is? Do you know who the owner of the building is? Do you know who the lessee was? You need to get the deeds. You need to find out. You need to send investigators out. If you don't have access to a good investigator or a good investigative company, let me know, I'll point you in the right direction or ask colleagues. You need to have that. That is a must for any lawyer. You need, and they will do it for you. They do a great job. They'll pull deeds for you. They'll identify owners. They'll canvas the area for witnesses and video surveillance. But you wanna get that investigator out. We talked about it in part one early on. This is one of those reasons to get you the data to identify the potential tort feasors because you want to have all of them listed and you wanna list them properly. If you know that you're suing McDonald's because an accident happened at McDonald's, do you just sue McDonald's? Is it McDonald's Corporation? Is it McDonald's Holding Corp? Is it a franchise owned by another company? You need to find all of this out. So you wanna get an investigator in and make sure you have the proper parties named in the complaint and that you name them if they're an ink, as an ink, as an LLP, because you can run into problems because if you name the wrong legal entity, you're not naming the right party, okay? And that's on you and that's malpractice. So you need to take your time, do your investigation uh, and make sure that you've identified everybody as best as you could. Sometimes you don't know everybody. So you name the major players and then you seek leave to amend when players are identified. You can put a John Doe or Jane Doe and that's what you'll see in a complaint when you know there were perpetrators involved or maybe an individual at a business, but you haven't gotten that name yet. So that's a placeholder. And then you amend the complaint later on through discovery when you find out who that individual is, if it turns out they are a tortfeasor. A great website, you could type it in your Google now or later, just type Secretary of State New York. And I think most states have the same thing. If you type up Secretary of State New York, the website for the New York Department of State pops up. Uh, there's a drop down menu, business search. You go to business search and you type in the name of who you believe the tortfeasor is if it's a company. And you can search by the name exactly or the first few words or letters of the name. Uh, that'll give you a lot of information. It will give you their full name, their address, 
uh, if they have officers, who the officers are, if they're active, if they're dissolved, if they're registered in New York, sometimes you may not know. It may be uh, an accident that happens with a big name company out of state. You type them into Secretary of State, lo and behold, they've registered to do business here. They've, uh, they've put themselves in the jurisdiction of New York. So use that website, check that out. Uh, many of them uh, will designate uh, a process server uh, company to receive uh, the summons and complaint, which is great. That identifies who to serve the summons and complaint on. So use that, um, do your homework, okay? It's really, really important. And part of doing your homework is when you get into more complex cases. Now, I've attached a summons and complaint here um, for medical malpractice, a product liability, there's even a personal trainer negligence one. And in those complaints, before I'm drafting those complaints, I am consulting with experts. And a lot of people ask me, when do you bring your experts on board? And depending on the type of case it is, you need to spend that money right away. Uh, you've hopefully consulted with an expert before taking on the case or shortly after taking it on to determine if it's a viable case. And you wanna make sure you frame the complaint properly and put the proper theories of negligence in there, the proper statutes that may have been violated in there. And oftentimes we don't know that as lawyers without the benefit of an expert. I have a medical malpractice case pending right now against doctors in two major hospitals in the New York metropolitan area. And I had to retain, <laughs> I think I have five different medical experts uh, that I've retained already to review everything that I've had meetings with. And I had all of those consultations before filing the complaint because I wanted to make sure where there may have been departures. I wanted to make sure I include those in my complaint. I wanted to make sure I use the right language that I went down every path uh, that there may have been a departure uh, with the proper area. So if I needed an ICU doctor, an anesthesiologist, um, infectious disease doctor, whatever it may be, I consulted with all of them. In a products liability case, you need to consult with your products expert. If you're claiming it was a defective product, uh, you may have a, a biomechanical engineer or a medical, uh, a, I'm sorry, a metallurgist uh, or a chemical engineer, whatever your expert is for that specific product, you need to consult with that expert and make sure you put in the right language. Also, different types of cases will require different pleading. So I've tried to give you an idea in the complaints I've given you samples of, of some interesting cases that need specific pleading. You will see attached, I gave you a state complaint uh, involving a tree fall case that happened in Central Park many years ago. And in that case, whenever you have a case against the city of New York, uh, there the city owns the property, but the parks department managed it. So you'll see we named both. So we did our homework to find that out, obviously. Uh, I've had cases in Bryant Park where the city owned it, but uh, Bryant Park has a private managing agent for it. So you have to do your homework to name the proper parties. But as many of you know, in any case against the city, you have to comply with 50H of the municipal law, make sure that you uh, appear for a hearing. And if you haven't appeared for a hearing and the time's waived, then you can file it. Otherwise you need to appear first. So you put that language in that a year and 90 days have not yet elapsed, that you've appeared for the 50H where it was waived. So you'll see that language in the complaint. I've included a sample complaint for a labor law construction accident case. In a labor law construction accident, you always need to plead or it's malpractice. Uh, labor law 200, which is basically the common law negligence codified. Uh, New York labor law statute um, 240 subdivision one, which is the scaffold law and labor law 241 subdivision six, which is if there is an industrial code violation. Uh, so I've attached that complaint there so you can copy the language and make sure you, you cite those causes of action. The personal trainer negligence complaint I put in just to give you an idea of what things look different and some language in there that's attached. A medical malpractice case uh, is attached. Uh, in medical malpractice, you have to, under the law, consult with an expert before filing suit. And you are required under the law to file a certificate of merit uh, in accordance with filing. And at the same time that you file a medical malpractice summons a complaint, you need to include your certificate of merit 
Again, I've given you a sample of a medical malpractice uh, complaint, which is attached, as well as a certificate of merit. Again, use the language. That's why I'm giving these to you. Uh, that says that you've consulted with a medical expert who has advised you that they believe that there is indeed the potential for a viable case here. Um, that is a requirement. So you must, must, must uh, confer with an expert, and you should. Nobody should be filing a medical malpractice complaint unless you've had that case screened by a medical expert in the field uh, uh, that is the subject matter of that complaint. Otherwise, you are doing a disservice to yourself, to your client, uh, and, uh, and, com and really committing malpractice. Uh, plus, you never would want to file one. Why are you going to file a complaint uh, without really knowing if you have a case or the potential for a case first? Uh, the days of thinking that you could send a claim letter or just file a complaint in a medical malpractice case and get it settled, that doesn't happen. My friends out there on the defense side and on the claim side, you know that doesn't happen. That's why you don't just get a claim letter and, uh, and expect to get paid on it. So um, just be careful, folks. Be careful. I've attached a product liability complaint for you. In a product liability action, not only should you have your experts, but you must, must, must plead certain things. You have to plead the appropriate defendants. Uh, it's what we call the chain of distribution. So in a product liability case, you're naming the manufacturer, you're naming the distributor. So the manufacturer makes the product. They might be in China. They build it. The distributor is who receives it, let's say, into the United States and sends it out to everybody, to all the stores. Uh, the complaint I've attached for you as an example uh, involves a uh, exercise ball. Um, that my client, who was a trainer from Germany, came to the Hilton Hotel. He was doing uh, chest presses on the ball and it burst. And he broke both of his wrists when the weights went down and it collapsed. So we brought a product liability case. Uh, the claim was that this uh, burst resistant exercise ball burst. So we had to name the manufacturer in China, the distributor, the company you'll see is Vallejo that came into the case. And then Vallejo sold it to all the, you know, Models and Dick's Sporting Goods stores where our client ultimately bought it from. You name all of those. Sometimes you don't need to, and that's a decision you need to consider. I don't think we named the manufacturer you'll see in this complaint because we weren't sure and we didn't think that we can necessarily get jurisdiction or there may be problems serving them in China. Uh, but we felt comfortable by having the distributor involved uh, was enough and it was. Um, that is a federal complaint that you have. We had diversity of jurisdiction. So we had the uh, client in Germany, the case was here in New York. Uh, it was tough because we had to get our experts and we bought like 10 of those balls and had an expert in Pittsburgh blow them all up and burst them and, and it got, it, it was quite interesting, but I gave you a sample of that complaint. You need to make sure you name all the proper parties in a product liability case. You're also gonna plead that the defendants violated express warranty of merchantability, implied warranty of merchantability. So make sure you do things right. You say uh, the right things in the complaint, you name the right parties, you consult with your experts and you list the appropriate statutes. And if you mess up or you're sitting there in a case you're thinking about now saying, oh my God, I didn't do that, amend your complaint. You can do it by step or by an order. Again, there has to be uh, prejudice shown in order to uh, deny that request. Um, and usually if you're before the filing of a note of issue, it's no problem at all. So you're also gonna want an expert in any unusual situation. Uh, I had a case once where a stunt person was injured. And so we brought in a stunt expert to show us what the departures were before we filed the complaint, all right? So in the few minutes I've left, let's talk about verification. You should always have your client verify it. You'll see on some of the complaints I gave you, the client did verify it. If the client does not reside in the county that your office is in, you can verify it. We do that sometimes with the consent of our client to get things moving, but you always want your client to verify it. They know what's going on. It's proof if there's any issues that they were on board, they reviewed it, they signed it, they were on board. Get it verified if you can. Also, if you need to attach your complaint for a default motion, if it's verified by the um, plaintiff, then they're saying that the state, the statement of facts are accurate within them. So you can submit the complaint as proof in a default motion. Um, then you get to uh, filing, okay? Filing, almost everything's e-filed now, which is great. 
Uh, you can file it with the ECF in almost all the counties in New York State, I think, and uh, certainly federal court. You can do an ECF filing throughout the state of New York. I've attached a civil cover page uh, that you use in federal court as a sample. You can get those forms. All the federal forms are online. I think most of the state ones too. I've also included summons with the complaint. You have to um, serve a summons. You file the complaint. Usually what happens is you'll file a complaint. Then you get notice of an index number uh, by the court. And then you have a filed copy of the complaint with the index number. Then you get it to your process server. You have your process server serve it. Don't worry about different ways to serve. That's what you pay a process server for. Don't worry about nail and mail. You want personal service if possible. If that's a problem, then speak with your process server about the options for other ways of service. Um, federal court, you're gonna file a summons, get it stamped by the clerk. You'll see a sample in the materials and uh, then you will serve it also with a process server. In federal court, you can actually serve it um, by mail with a waiver of service form. The idea is that um, if they agree to waive service and accept it, they send you that form signed. It gives them extra time to answer. They end up having 60 days to answer, saves you the cost, and then you don't have to serve them. If they don't sign it, then they understand that uh, you can use a process server and they have to pay your costs. So I always use that feature in my federal cases. I FedEx the summons and complaint with the waiver of service document. Makes life easy. So you have to file your affidavits of service. So you give your summons and complaint to your process server, your process server will file it, and then they will, you ask them to email you the process of service once it is served, stay on them. Once you get the affidavit of service, you then file that with the court. So once your complaint is filed, your affidavit of service is filed, you are set, you are good to go. If they don't answer the summons and complaint in a timely fashion, uh, then you can move for a default judgment and you attach your summons and complaint and your affidavit of service as proof. Um, these process servers, they're professionals. If there's any issues or challenge to service, look for that in the answer. We're gonna talk about that uh, in part three. Part three is set, we're ready to go. I hope you're gonna come back and join me March 3rd on Wednesday. And what we'll talk is what's coming next in the litigation. That's gonna be, you're gonna hear from your adversary. You've just filed a summons and complaint. You're waiting on the answer and it's gonna be a lawyer, a law firm, someone signing that. We're gonna talk about what you do when you get that. We're gonna talk about how you get discovery going, the initial conference in state court and federal court, initial discovery, the must have demands and how you respond and handle things. That's gonna be part three. So I look forward to seeing you for part three. Um, stay along now if you'd like. I'm gonna hit, hit all the Q and A's that I can. As always, please reach out to me. People do all the time and I love it. You, if you ask around, you'll find I'm very generous with my time, my materials. I think that in our profession, it's important that we all work together, fellow plaintiff's lawyers, adversaries, um, everybody, and it makes our profession run more smoothly, gets our cases resolved. I love to refer cases out. I love to accept referrals, work with you on cases. So stay in touch with me. Uh, my info is attached uh, above, smileylaw.com, asmiley at smileylaw.com, andrew at the mentor ESQ, just Google me. I'm really easy to find and I look forward to speaking with you. Um, if you're listening to the podcast, as always, please share it with your friends, uh, colleagues, and classmates, and like it on social media if you did like it. Um, so with that being said, uh, it's now 201. I want to get to some Q&As, and uh, if I don't get to your specific Q&A, you can feel free to follow up with me afterwards, or maybe I just don't know the answer. I, I certainly don't know the answer to everything, uh, but I'm going to do as much as I can. All right, so let's get to the Q&A. Thank you all for hanging there in with me for the Q&A. So I'm gonna try and take them in order. First question we have here is, what is an attorney's obligation to settle a case after repeated demand by a client when the attorney believes they can do better and get more money moving forward? So here's a case where you think the case is worth 250,000 from a $300,000 policy. The first offer is 50,000. Your client says, take it, I want it, I want it. Okay, but you're like, you're crazy. You shouldn't take 50,000. You could get 250,000. Hang in there. So the answer is what your obligation is, is to listen to your client. If your client says, settle my case, you settle their case. That's the easy answer. If they want the 50 grand, they say, I don't care, Smiley, what you think you can get. I want the 50 grand. You settle the case. It stinks because you know you can get the more and you would make more, but you work for the client. 
okay? And if your client says yes, it's yes. If your client says no, it's no when it comes to settlement. The way that I handle those situations is I inform my client. I give them as much information. I explain to them, I will do whatever you want. I have these conversations all the time. If you want me to settle, say the word and I'll settle your case for what's on the table now or what maybe they'll do. I think I can get you more. I can't guarantee it, but I think it can get you substantially more if you're willing to hang in there for three more months or another year. Um, so I will have that conversation and it's up to the client if they would decide to wait or hang in there. So the people are different. Some need the money, they wanna be done and some don't. So you have to play it as, as it goes, but you need your job is always to inform your client and listen to your client. If they are unreasonable and you have a great offer of $2 million from a $2 million policy and they say, I'm not signing the releases, I wanna go after the defendant, let's go, let's go, let's go. And the case is only worth a million dollars. You know, you're going to try real hard to explain it to them, but if they're not going to listen to you, you have no choice but to move forward. And especially if it's on the eve of trial, a judge is not going to let you off the case. If it's early enough and you know you're going to have disagreements, you can just uh, move to be relieved and place a lien on the file for the work you've done. Be aware, you don't get a lien on the offer that's on the table at the time that you move to be relieved or get discharged. That is a, a common mistake people make. Your lien is based on the work you've done. So just because an offer is up, there's case on this, doesn't mean you get a third of what's on the table. Uh, that's a little secret that not everybody, it's not a secret, but it's it's not commonly known. So if you're negotiating a fee uh, with an outgoing attorney, you may wanna say, look, I had to offer, I want my fee on that. I'll certainly make that argument every day of the week, but push comes to shove, you may not get it. Um, what's the procedure for serving an amended summons and complaint after the defendant has been served? At what point do you need to uh, file a notice of motion? My understanding is that as long as your adversary agrees, uh, which most will, as long as it's reasonable within a reasonable time, and it happens a lot where you may name the wrong entity. I get calls from defense counsel, hey, you named the LLP, but the one that owned this is really their LLC. I'll send you the proof you need. And uh, you just do a step to amend with a so order and you submit it, and usually that's good enough. I don't think you need a court order to amend if you have an agreement and a stipulation. Someone check me if I'm wrong on that, and it may change in time, but generally, as long as you have consent and a stipulation, uh, then you're free to amend, and that's what you do. Um, someone is asking me, what county is the venue for an action in New York State? All right, here comes the law school problem. We've got a um, venue question. We've got a foreign corporation, they're authorized to do business in New York, but the harm is caused outside of New York and it's a New York resident. Great sample. So here we have accident happens in Connecticut to your client who lives in New York. You practice in New York. You find out that it's a Connecticut um, houseware store, uh, but they are authorized to do business in New York. You bring it in New York in the venue where they have their registered uh, business address. Go into the Secretary of State, find out their registered business address in New York. That's where you bring venue. I think you'd also be okay with the venue of where uh, the plaintiff is if it's in New York State. So I think those are your two choices there uh, if you wanna keep it in New York. All right, next question um, being asked, Andrew, when do you start consulting with a liability expert on a case? Do you recommend any of the expert service companies such as TASA? I like to get going with my experts pretty early on um, in the investigation phase. Uh, I never wait on an expert uh, for long at all. I find that gets cases resolved. It helps you tailor your depositions. We'll talk about that uh, as we get into the next parts. Get your experts on as early as you can afford to do so and uh, get them everything. They will help you uh, figure out what to get discovery, what to ask for, to prepare for your depositions, to frame the complaint. They'll be ready to sign your affidavits for summary judgment motions, to defend against a motion or to make a motion. I like to get my experts on early, early, early. Uh, and yeah, you know, I've worked with all of these companies and um, do your homework. What I would do is, uh, you know, find out, make sure you get a free consultation with their proposed expert before you spend any money. Make sure they explain what all the fees are. If it's a fee uh, all in, if it's a fee just for them to broker and give you an expert, if it's a fee uh, just to, you know, get the expert, then a different fee. 
uh, for the experts. So just do your homework. But yeah, a lot of these companies are good. A lot of these experts uh, that are available in these services are, are, are great and they're, they're, they know what they're doing. They can really help you in litigation. Um, someone's talking about in an infant case when you e-file. Wait, hold up one quick second. For sponsors, check out the back of the CLE materials from today's course. There's a whole list of Academy sponsors. Those are the guys that support the bar. So please, when you're in need of various services, check out our sponsors first. Get quotes from them first, use them first. They support the bar and love us. So we should love them back whenever we can. Absolutely. Absolutely. We have great sponsors. And again, join the Academy. It's like a hundred bucks and you're in and everything's free and all the resources are just fantastic. So if you're not a member, just do it. And if you have a law firm, you can get, speak to Michelle. She'll negotiate a sweet deal for you to have your whole firm covered. So reach out to her and all your attorneys will be members. You get a firm membership uh, for a really good deal. Uh, and she's open to negotiation. She's a pretty good negotiator, but it's worth making that call. Um, someone, Thank you, gave a heads up. Uh, when you file an infant case, you need to redact the infant's information. Definitely do that. In an infant case, anything filed with the court, including comp orders at the end, you have to redact the infant's name and any details about the infant. So what you would do is you would say, Andrew Smiley as parent and natural guardian of L period, J period, an infant. And then in the facts, it's on the such and such a date, L period, J period was running across the street. So you handle it that way. You also need to make sure you never file any documents in any e-filing state or federal with social security numbers. So be aware of that. That goes with exhibits, everything. So be real careful. Um, next question, how do you handle a worker's compensation lien? How you handle that is during the course of the litigation, you make sure you reach out to the lien holder, find out who it is, get frequent updates in writing of the lien amount, um, let them know that you have a case pending. I usually don't like my clients to settle their liens uh, before the case settles. Uh, we can talk about that at another time. Uh, and then what you do is you need to get written consent before settling a case from the worker's compensation lien holder. They will give it to you. They don't give you a hard time. Uh, they just want to make sure their lien is protected. Then you call them up, you negotiate it. They'll usually reduce it by a third. There's other ways to get reductions if you waive future benefit rights and, and other things we can get into the weeds on. But generally, that's how you handle a worker's compensation lien. Um, okay. Um, someone's talking about the procedure methodology of getting jurisdiction via VTL 253. I don't recall what that section is off the top of my head. If whoever asked that is still on and you want to uh, pull it up and drop it in the chat or the q and I'd be happy to talk further on that. Um, please explain why uh, the Port Authority is subject to Bronx jurisdiction and does the TBTA of New York subject to the same rules? Um, I've had cases against the TBTA. I've had them in New York County. I've had the Port Authority cases in New York County. Um, I think they're generally amenable to jurisdiction and available in most of the counties in New York City because they have action and business there. And certainly they're, in, they're both within the jurisdiction of the state of New York. And uh, I think where the action occurs, you can bring it. If not, then there must be a separate statute. I don't recall it of where you have to bring it against them. I don't know it off the top of my head. So if someone wants to knows the answer and can chime in, uh, please help uh, this lawyer out that's asking the question. I've generally found it's not a problem to sue the TBTA, which is the Triborough Bridge and Tunnel Authority uh, in the venue uh, that you want to uh, bring it in. Um, and certainly I brought it, I remember bringing a case in New York County uh, that the incident occurred in the Bronx. And I remember bringing uh, a case in New York County against the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey uh, in, in New York as well. So I don't think that that's, there's usually much of a problem there. Where it gets interesting is if the accident happens on the GW bridge, you got to see which side. Literally, there's like a line down the middle of the bridge and you want to see which side. Was it the Jersey side or the New York side? So if you go on like a Google map, try and figure it out. Sometimes the police report will help you out. So that makes things interesting uh, on that. You got a quick response. VTL 253 is service on the Secretary of State when there's an out-of-state driver in an accident in New York. Ah, so I believe what that's referring to is they, by 
having an accent in New York, you can serve. There's many instances where you can serve process on Secretary of State. They'll accept service on behalf of out of state and then they notify them of it. And I believe that's how it works. Again, um, you'd be surprised. You get a lot of nice people out of New York City. For those of you up in um, maybe Albany where New York State DMV and Secretary of State and the headquarters are, you can call and ask them how it works or ask your process serving company and they'll let you know. They know that stuff better than I do. To be honest, I don't handle a lot of the day-to-day -day with the process service. My paralegals and my uh, process service company do a great job and the process service companies, the good ones, they know where, how, and how all of this works. Um, all right, in a contract action where the lawyer's office is in one county, but the property and the other parties are in another. Um, again, I think if you're all in New York State, file it where your uh, client is or where it's a home friendly venue for you if one of the parties or the property is there. Um, I wouldn't worry so much about where the lawyer's office to the contract is. I don't think that has anything to do with it. It's usually where the subject matter of the contract is or the parties to the contract. So look at that. Um, next question. Uh, you can call your treating doctor as a fact witness, avoid expert disclosure, but testimony is somewhat limited. Uh, so they are citing uh, in federal court. So how it works with a treating doctor is Yes, they are not an expert. You don't have to disclose them as an expert, but you are required to give a summary of the facts and the opinions that you anticipate to elicit from them. So if they're going to talk about treating your client and then you want to go a step further and say, and do you have an opinion doctor within a reasonable degree of medical certainty as to whether the plaintiff is going to require future medical care and treatment and what surgery is it and what's your opinion as to the cost? If you're going to go that far, you need to put that in a blurb uh, and you have to exchange that information as part of your pretrial exchanges as early as possible. Uh, and if the defendant wants to depose the treating doctor, they are certainly entitled to do that. So be aware in New York State, no 3101D exchanges are required. Uh, no expert witness exchanges are required for treating doctors in New York State. Don't have to give them a blurb. You just put them up on the stand. And as long as you give authorizations, it's fine. If it's really important, you may want to just send a cover letter prior to trial than authorization saying we intend to call so-and-so uh, as a treating doctor to give opinion testimony and talk about the treatment and causation. Here's a, another authorization and then you'll be protected and fine. Um, all right, someone's saying there's a recent amendment regarding the treating physician being treated as an expert under the new rules. We spoke about this. All right, we just covered that. Um, how do you determine a high low without going too low? That is a great question. Um, I love doing high lows. It's a guarantee to protect your client on the low. Uh, it gives the defendant a cap on the high. Usually you'll cap it at their insurance coverage as a high is what I shoot for. Maybe save them a little bit of a break uh, if you have to, to get there. Uh, and that's how you negotiate the low. The low is really what you feel comfortable with. If you know it's a case that you're not getting sent home on, that there's no chance, it's not a threshold case. Let's say it's an auto accident and you have a fracture. And it's a matter of whether the case is going to go for 100 grand or, you know, 600 grand. And everybody agrees you're somewhere in between there. You know, then, then you just sort of work it out. And, and you see, you, you sort of play tit for tat. You say you'll go lower if they go higher. So you always want to get that high. As a plaintiff's lawyer, I'm always concerned about the high. I want that to be as high as possible uh, if I think I can get near the high. Uh, and the low just gravy. Uh, make sure there's a little cushion in there, unless I'm really worried that this could be a defense case. In high-low ARBs, you're usually, they're usually not going to send you home with nothing. Um, so use it as a bargaining chip and just make sure you have authority from your client and uh, try and get the high as high as possible. All right, moving right along. Thank you to the 300 plus of you hanging in there with me. All right, um, here's one. I brought a case for a New York plaintiff involving an accident in Nantucket. Uh, where he and his wife were riding on a, on a scooter against the Nantucket Rental Company. Had to bring it in Boston Federal Court because there was, that's where the accident occurred. Nantucket had a $10,000 sovereign immunity limit and the rental company was not a deep pocket. Interesting. So sovereign immunity to me means if you were bringing a case against 
uh, municipality. If the rental company is a private company, uh, then their insurance is going to cover it. And if they're a small company and they don't have assets, you're kind of stuck uh, because you don't have jurisdiction. If your New York clients are in Massachusetts, injured on Massachusetts property by a Massachusetts defendant, Massachusetts is the proper jurisdiction and venue. Someone asked me about my Mexico vacation example. Would it be easier to file the case in Mexico or the US, assuming you have jurisdiction? Definitely easier to file it in Mexico. I consulted with a, a Mexican law firm down there and I found out that the laws stink for plaintiffs in Mexico uh, and that I probably wouldn't get anything. And uh, if we could bring it in New York, it'd be that much better. Um, so you have to do your homework. If the odds are better for your client in the local venue, and you can bring in a lawyer, a local counsel to do it in, in a foreign court, uh, but then you're giving up the case unless you're licensed to practice in that foreign jurisdiction. Uh, you're much better bringing it on your own turf if you have the ability to do so, which isn't that easy. Um, all right, someone's letting me know uh, this is a case uh, of medical neglig negligence against New York Presbyterian Hospital. Um, and uh, the insurance company sent letters about it. Uh, the manager said it was the worst uh, case in her career. The statute of limitations lapsed. Um, and, uh, you know, they're in, they're in a situation now where the statute expired. Look, there's no tolling of a statute because you're underway with negotiations or an acknowledgement of fault. You have to, have to, have to keep an eye on the statute. Uh, in some instances, I've run instances when we're trying to work it out, and you can, in some instances, get a party to agree to a voluntary, it's not that they're agreeing to toll the statute, but they're agreeing not to raise the affirmative defense of the statute of limitations being expired. So tricky stuff. Be very careful. Always keep an eye on that statute of limitations. Um, all right. Uh, hey, I'm getting uh, a notice from one of the attorneys that was on the uh, Schmelzer case that I attached. Uh, nice to see you, Michael. Thank you for uh, reaching out. That was a long time ago. Uh, hopefully uh, what I'm saying makes some sense. And, um, and I'm glad to, you know, it's always interesting who shows up and listens to these CLEs. Uh, and it's all the more reason we're gonna talk about next why it's important how you carry yourself as a lawyer because your reputation will follow you. I think that Schmelzer case, if you have the materials up, someone could tell me, I think the complaint must have been at least 10, 15 years ago. Uh, and here I've got another lawyer reaching out to me from that case. You run into other lawyers all the time. Your reputation will follow you. Be a good person, be a good lawyer. Uh, it's important, it happens that they come back to you. Um, all right. Uh, all right, someone is saying, I have a client that has a personal injury case you're not interested in, but he wants to bring it on his own. Um, you know what they say about a person that has themselves as a lawyer, a client uh, who is their own lawyer, not a good idea. And um, as an individual not represented by an attorney, does he have to file a summons and complaint by e-filing? I do not think he has the capability to do so. Um, you have to check with the clerk of the county where it's being filed. Uh, and let them know they have to comply with the rules. You can register uh, for e-filing uh, as a pro se. I know you can do that. So they probably just have to register and then e-file it. So I would recommend that they do that. If they run into problems, call the clerk of that county. Um, whether or not you have a client sign the verification for the file, do you think that having an attorney sign the verification will serve to avoid the possibility of having the client undergo examination by the defendant point by point on possibly confusing paragraphs of the complaint. I have never had a defense lawyer go point by point in a complaint with my client. I've had them go through a verified bill of particulars, never a complaint. Um, look, the lawyer signs the complaint anyway. Uh, you have to sign the complaint as a lawyer. And I don't think that would be a reason not to have the client verify the complaint. Uh, and again, the client is verifying it. You'll see a sample of our client verification page and the materials. They're just saying that they believe the facts to be true upon information and belief. And if they're questioned on something that is legalese that us lawyers put in, they could say, I don't know what that is. 
And I verified it just for the facts that I knew to be accurate. That I assume was something my lawyer put in for whatever reason, okay? Um, all right, someone is asking me, did I choose the right court, even though I was aware of the limitations of liability? Look, you know, that depends. You're always gonna run into situations. Sometimes you have options, um, but if you chose the wrong court uh, and that could have let, let your client have a better recovery, you know, there may be an issue there. Uh, I don't know the answer specifically. Uh, that would depend on the facts. Reach out to me afterwards. I'm happy to chat with you about it. Have I had any issues with filing a summons and complaint at a later date after the normal statute of limitation using the tolling time by the governor? Good question. Um, I haven't run into that situation yet. We had a great CLE, I think more than one here on the Academy. You can find it online about how that works. I don't think anyone's running into issues uh, with that. I think the courts are going out of their way not to reject complaints, not to enter default judgments during the time we're in. And I think they have outs to do that. So I haven't run into that at least. Um, all right. Any tips in vetting out or selecting a plaintiff's attorney for a case? So if you're talking about referring it to an attorney, uh, referring a case, if you're talking as a client, uh, finding the right attorney, if you're talking about a carrier and you're a defense lawyer and want to do some homework on a lawyer, I always start by Googling them, uh, checking out their website, uh, Googling, seeing as much information you could find out about them, checking online, making sure they're, they're uh Legal licenses are up to date. They haven't been sued. Um, see if you know anybody that knows the lawyer. Like I said, reputations go a long way. After many years, I'm very happy if someone's interviewing me. I say, ask around. Anybody in this area of law will probably know my name or know who I am. You could ask them what their thoughts are. So that's usually the best way to vet. You're going to want to see if someone has lectured, uh, if someone has been involved in organizations, uh, they've gotten results on the types of cases uh, that you're looking for them to handle. Um, okay. Let's see. Would I wait to settle a Medicare or Medicaid lien? Yeah, you always wait until the case ends, always. Uh, Medicare will always reduce by a third and they'll ask you to fill out a form with its what your expenses were and your fee, and they have your formulas. So you always wait uh, until the case settles, uh, but you have to be aware of the lien and obviously not distribute any money from your escrow account uh, to the client until the liens are satisfied. Medicaid these days, folks, has been a real nightmare. HRA usually handles city cases uh, for Medicaid liens, but now a lot of that's getting shipped up to Albany to HMS to handle those. They each don't keep in touch with each other. It's half the time one saying they have a $400,000 lien when you've already paid off a lien to the other for $200,000. It's a nightmare. So you have to deal with it. I recommend uh, some of our sponsors assist in, in those liens and they do a great job of it. Get them on board. It's worth the, the fee. Um, what do I tell my clients if they want to take out a law cash type of loan? We're getting a little afar of the subject matter of this, but I'm happy to answer questions as long as you all want to stay on here. Look, I hate law funding. Um, I hate that because the client uses it as a bankroll. They then um, think it's fine. Uh, the money goes up and up and up with interest. And by the time you go to settle the case, sometimes that money gets so high, it's an impediment to settling. I encourage my clients not to borrow money if they really, really don't have to. But if they have to, the reality is, if you don't assist them with that, they will go to a lawyer who will assist them and leave you and, leave, and you won't have the case anymore. So you have to give them guidance, tell them you don't like it, tell them you're going to help them and try and work with a company that is not going to uh, go crazy with the rates on them uh, in doing that. Um, a lot of people, thank you, are putting really good uh, points in the Q&A, uh, giving answers that either I'm not giving or supplementing answers to uh, my answers. Uh, can you choose venue based on a PO box? Good question. I think it would be hard to do that. I think if you show, you probably have to show more that the reason they have a PO box is because they have substantial contacts and they gain substantial revenue doing business in that region. And that is what would give you contact, enough contacts to get jurisdiction. Um, let's see. Uh, what are your remedies if the plaintiff does not verify complaint and the plaintiff lives in the same county as the plaintiff's firm? The BP is also not verified. They are disabled and illiterate. So 
um, you need to send somebody to their home and read it to them and then have them sign it. Uh, and perhaps video or audio saying that someone did explain everything and they are signing it. You can do that. Uh, you can set up a Zoom, you can email it to them, set up a Zoom conference, read it to them on Zoom, record the Zoom and ask them to sign it, uh, send somebody to pick it up. So those are different ways to do that. Um, someone's asking me about the executive order tolling. Um, don't ask me those questions. I'm not the expert on that. Uh, I would look to the CLE and the person that gave the CLE for the Academy on tolling issues with COVID because uh, it's tricky stuff. Uh, someone, hey, uh, defense counsel, uh, you often do paragraph questions in a summons a complaint concerning the uh, a slip and fall in a supermarket where the complaint stated the defendant should have set off flares. Um, uh, they're suggesting always look carefully at the complaint. Thank you uh, for that. And uh, yeah, let your plaintiff clients know before a deposition, pull out the complaint uh, and the BP, uh, go through the facts that are listed in there uh, and let them know that they may be asked about it so that they're prepared. Preparation, preparation, preparation. I'm gonna be getting into uh, parts of this series where you're gonna hear me talk a lot about preparation. Ultimately, the most important thing in what we do as lawyers is being prepared. Um, hello, someone's saying that they are solo with a tight budget. For med mal cases, it's good to use a service for reviewing the cases for an opinion that you can use to file and hire an expert later in the case. So you're talking about these services that for a good price, it'll have a doctor who's sort of a all around doctor that knows a lot about everything. And it's enough to certify you, uh, give you a certificate of merit, tell you that you think you have a case and file it. I use those at the start of my practice. I'm not a fan of that. Um, if you have a tight budget, um, then borrow money, get a credit line, or team up with a firm that doesn't have a tight budget, because otherwise you're doing your client a disservice. So I'm happy to speak with you afterwards and give you some pointers, reach out to me directly. But I've been running into a lot of issues and I've gotten contacted by people after CLEs where they just didn't have the right experts on board for medical malpractice. They say to me, oh, it was my first medical malpractice case and now it's coming up for trial. And you are potentially committing medical malpractice or legal malpractice, sorry, uh, if you take a medical malpractice case and you don't know what you're doing and you don't get the right experts on early. Uh, so I would just tread very uh, carefully uh, in cases, again, medical malpractice, product liability, cases that are not auto or premise cases that require uh, experts. You wanna make sure that you bring in the right experts at the right time, spend what you have to. If the case warrants it, you have to do it. Um, it's part of your obligation to your client, in my opinion. And if you, you have to look in the mirror and if you're not prepared to go the distance and spend what you need to, to advocate properly, you're doing your client a disservice and you need to bring in a firm like me or someone else that specializes in these cases who can help you and your client work out a fee arrangement and everybody will work out for the best. Um, Someone saying that they provide a 3101 for treating physicians, as well as their regular experts, thinks that it eliminates any deficiency in the medical records. What do I think? I think it's fine. No reason not to. I mean, I'm a big believer and there's no secrets in litigation. And everyone's like, do you think I should hold off on letting them know? Um, very rarely will I say yes on holding back on anything. And if you're reeling off all your 3101s, then send out one for your treating. Why not? I think it's a great idea. Um, you know, it just gives them more to prepare if you're going to attach a CV, if you're going to give their credentials, you're not required to do that. The downside is, is that uh, if the trial attorney on the defense side is not prepared, um, which unfortunately I run into a lot who are not, and it's only because they're probably dropped the file in their lap the night before the case starts because they're running around like crazy trying to do their job uh, and they haven't had the time to do homework on a treating physician. Um, it may make their life a lot easier if you've given them a, a curriculum vitae uh, that talks about everything and then they see something and they can Google an article or Google your expert and find things a lot faster. Uh, they make them more prepared. So that's the only sort of strategy that you may want to use to consider. Um, all right, so I think I've covered, uh, gone through everything that I think that I could give an answer to. It's 2.32. Um, I thank you all so much for staying on, listening to me, 
And uh, I look forward to part three. We're going to keep it going. If there's more stuff that you want to hear about, um, let me know. Let Michelle know. We'll get another CLE specifically on a topic if it warrants a, an hour long uh, discussion. Otherwise, I look forward to taking this next step in our journey with you. And uh, have a great rest of the day.